Welcome back to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and with me is my uh, guest and, of course, my co-host, Martin Nunley. And we got a lot to talk about, so let's jump right back into it and let's uh, let's continue. Thank you. There's something about the Dogman. Now, now, we made Harry and the Hendersons, of course, you know, but I don't think you're ever going to have a Dogman in the Hendersons because there's something about this creature that just elicits a response of sheer dread you know unlike any other cryptid out there like whenever you talk about the Loch Ness monster it's not immediately oh my goodness no I never want to see that but whenever you come into the idea of the dogman there is something there and you know I would be you know I, I would be open to anybody about this there is an overt spiritual element uh, to the dogman that none of these other cryptids have and that's what sets it aside from everything else in the paranormal world that and possibly you know aliens with the abduction experience that is about the two that causes such a a a, a very visceral response to these things i don't i don't ever <laughs> like you said i don't ever think there'll be a uh yeah a harry and the henderson's dogman version i just don't see how that could work because these things are not i guess you know you can kind of make make it look like it's some sort of like a uh, friendly cartoony thing when it comes to like Sasquatch because you can make it more of a human like face and give it these but making a canid do that you know in, in a real life not in a cartoony way that's easy to do look at Scooby Doo he's on two legs running around you know um, but you can't do that in, you know and it, it, it's a lot harder to do uh, with like a you know live action Right, 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 right. But I mean, and it would yeah. be, <laughs> I, I don't see how you could make that either. I mean, you know, but, but there are so many people out there right now, Ron, um, that, and, and Barton knows this, we've come across them many times and we've had to argue with them and tell them, don't do this. But they're like, the dog men are okay. They're friendly. And, and I've, I've read on, on, from various dog man groups on my show, I've read these people saying how they give them things and, there's been a whole group of them that were out in their camp out that they had and they were giving them like hot dogs and stuff and throwing them, don't tell them the kids to go and throw their le leftovers by the, by the wood line so they could eat. And I'm like, what? I mean, if that's true, you know, which I, I have a hard time believing that, but if that is true, that is like the height of your responsibility. I can't even imagine being that irresponsible. And, and, and like, if this is a creature that is a wild canid and say it is just, let's just say for argument's sake, it's a flesh and blood creature. It's still an alpha predator. And what, why would it take your hot dog leftovers when it could just eat you or your children? Your children. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's another yeah. good point there, Josh. Whenever we look at dog man stories, not only dog man stories, but werewolf stories, any story around the world that involves a, a intelligent dog like creature one of its first prey items is always children. Whether we're talking about the Beast of Gévaudan, or we're talking about the Werewolf of Bedburg, Germany, whatever whatever we're talking about, the idea that children are very easy prey uh, animals. You know, they're very easy, and you know, they can't run quickly. They don't have any claws or teeth to fight to fight to fight anything off. So yeah, this is dumb on a parent's point of view, but. There is also something to be said, too, on a spiritual level. You know, children have this innocence to them. And the idea that these creatures are focusing on children and that innocence may also have, uh, you know, a relation to the kind of creature, the kind of entity that we're dealing with, too. Yeah, I think in... in, in you know, like I covered a case and I've, I've talked about it at length where there was a kid, you know, but th there's been so many of those. If you look at the Hernandez ranch episode, the, 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 there was one of the beginning at the beginning of, of one of the episodes. I think it might've been the very beginning where Jerry as a guy that I worked with at a construction company. Um, I did security, but him and his brothers and his uncles were working there. And one of the things that, that, that I thought was telling was that his daughter when she was little, she said, look, honey, the Easter bunny, she, or look, daddy, the Easter bunny. And he said, honey, this isn't, there's no Easter bunny. This is, you know, it's Christmas time, you know? 
Uh, and she's little, little, like, like not even in school yet. I don't believe, I don't think she was even like, uh, in school and she points outside and he's like, what is she looking at? And he sees this thing step up behind a tree. And the reason she said that is because it had these really tall ears that made it look almost like the, the ears were so elongated. You know what I mean? That it was like, whoa, what is that? You know? And then he saw the face and he said, that's not a bunny. That thing has a big old, you know, like it, it's, it's a pronounced snout, you know, and it had these weird legs. And of course he starts staring at this thing going like, this must be what my uncles were talking about. Cause his uncles had said, you know, that there, these creatures existed. So when he looked at this thing, he had to explain to his daughter, you know, that's not the Easter bunny and take her and then called his wife. Hey, you know, and I think she was making dinner or doing something. I don't remember the whole story, but he handed the daughter to her, to her. And at this point, I think the kid was crying because of his reaction, but you know, it appeared to the child like it was innocent, you know? And at first the kids don't always react. They just think, Oh, it's just this uh, big furry thing, you know, but that's not, you know, reality. Yeah, there's a correlation to this this story that you just told and the uh, Little Red Riding Hood story, right? Whenever the uh, dog man assumes the the, the grandmother, uh, you know, the the the, the person persona of the grandmother. Um, I think fairy tales often are designed to tell a very real world uh, story. Uh, the problem, and I think that when we look at things like that, the big bad wolf, you know, the idea that there is a creature out there that is very human like and sometimes can even verbalize and interact with a human being, you know, we find this in fairy tales around the world. And it may be that there is an essence of truth behind these fairy tales, and we just look at them simply as children's stories, when in fact there's a morality tell there that has a very real world meaning behind it yeah the, the, the real red riding hood thing is like i don't know <laughs> that um it eats her grandmother and it's just it's crazy you know it's just like uh yeah it's a very it's like an abduction or something um right right yeah i mean a lot of it has to do i'm sure with not talking to strangers but it's just the idea that the wolf was capable of communicating uh, with the girl as she's making her way through the woods, and then intelligently decide, premeditate, that it's going to go to the grandmother's house and meet her there. You know, these are all very, you know, uh, these are terrifying elements of the way this creature interacts with the, the world around it. Well, do you think that when that story was written, do you think that that was, um, like it was made to, to, to be like a werewolf? Or do you think it was just like a... An allegory of, like you said, I mean, what, like, don't don't talk to strangers. Well, it, it it truly is an allegory, but without our understanding of the werewolf, I don't think that it would make any sense to us. Mm -hmm. You know, Ron, I was given, uh, like, I, I I was told by one of my listeners, like, the first year that we were doing the show, I think it was back in early 2019 or something like that, when I started doing the show. And I remember one of my listeners sending me like pictures from an old book and the book was, was, it was German. It was a Germanic book. And I think it was actually Saxony. It was where it was from. And it was from, and I'm not joking. I think it was like the 1400s. Like this book was old and this woman had gotten it from her like great, great grandmother. It had been passed down and these fairy tales, it had the, the fairy tales in there. And she had taken a picture of a couple of the, you know, and I think my, my old co-host probably had it in his email, but, it, but it's, it, she sent it to him and then he sent it to me, but it was like this, these pictures were of these, uh, like the Billy Goats Gruff. Um, I don't remember if that's one of the stories. I just remember that there was, there was a picture of a goat in there, but it was humanoidal. Um, it had like a ram's head, which is one of the type of goat man that you hear about. You hear about the goat man being like a goat head with a, with a human type body and then the goat legs. And then you, there's one that's like a ram's head and there's one that's a human head that has goat like horns. And then another one that has like ram like horns, but they're human like heads. So to me, that's like, there's different types of goat man. People just say goat man. It's like a catch all, but this thing definitely looked like a ram headed humanoidal character. And then it had a picture of a werewolf, when it, and when it talked about this wolf, and I don't remember the the and what it was in reference to, 
but it was like big bad wolf, you know, and, and, and then it was just, it was a werewolf. And these were pictures that were drawn like in, in the 15th century. And so you're sitting there looking at this going like, you know, this is an old, old, you know, book that was, you know, to the point where you couldn't move it much without it. It was falling apart, but it had been taken care of because it was, it was, uh, like bound in like a leather, you know, and the pit and the pages were very, like, you could tell they were old and it was, it was an old, old book. I mean, and, sh- and the, the person that sent us the, that was saying that it was from the 1400s, but, um, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I just know that the, that they were, it was like a book of stories, like fairy tales. And the characters were all like, uh, what's the word? Like anthropom- uh, yeah, uh, anthropomorphic. Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah. So, so that that's what it that's what it was. I mean, you know, these 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 characters were not, they weren't cute. Like it wasn't like a, an actual four legged animal. You know what I mean? They were all on two legs. And the fairy tales. I mean, so you're thinking if, if this was from the 1400s. You know, th- that that idea has been around for a long time, that these were bad guys. These are the bad guys. And they are, and they didn't look like cartoons. And, you know, they weren't That's drawn right. like cartoons. They were drawn like demons, you know. But they're not whimsical in any way. They no. are very realistic looking. Um, and, you know, that's the other thing, too, when we think about the idea of the goat man out there, these, uh, you know, these chimeras between two different creatures, you know, uh, you often now start thinking about the way um, Satan is portrayed, right? The devil is portrayed, you know, this, you know, ram's headed creature with uh, the cloven, uh, the feet. It all really comes and harkens back to this idea of a, a, a uh, it, it's terrifying whenever you think about it for a while, you know, this, this human like anthropomorphic being that has reason and has intelligence, but it also has these animalistic aspects that separates us from the created world, as if it is a mutation or some sort of subjugation of the of the creation that God had planned. It's kind of off on its own. It went rogue, and it became its own type of entity. Um, it's outside of the natural vibration of this world. That's that's frightening, guys. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, so you're saying that you think maybe these uh, old, old, old fairy tales could be something like uh, thinly disguised warnings of a real life danger masquerading as a fairy tale. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I do firmly believe in that kind of stuff, um, especially when we think about the oral tradition. So if this book was collected in the 1400s. Um, then the oral tradition probably went back at least 400 years. So we're going back into a time whenever, you know, science didn't even exist. Uh, This would have been an age of faith when everything that happened around you was either a sign of good or evil in the world. And I think the best way to drive that home is having an antagonist that reminds you so much of the 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 evil in the world, the chaos in the world, the 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 animalistic nature of this world. You throw in a anthropomorphic wolf in there, and people automatically understand it because it's an archetype. Because we in our distant past have encountered these things, and we still remember them today in our collective unconscious. And so, <clears throat> in your opinion, Ron, where do you think they came from originally? Oh my goodness, that's that's the loaded question. So I have one theory that um, whenever we talk about like the berserkers uh, in in Viking lore, uh, we know that the Vikings did that. We know that whenever Homer was writing the Odyssey and the Iliad, you know, two thousand years before Jesus or a thousand years before Jesus was born, uh, we know that there was cultures then that were wearing animal skins and taking that that nature of the animal and making it their own so they could fight. Uh, one of my beliefs is that, you know, in our distant past, we encountered other tribes that saw us as, as, as food. And we do know that uh, one of the collective skeletons uh, in our human closet 
is cannibalism. It's something that we don't want to talk about, uh, but there was times in our Earth's period that, you know, game, that prey animals were very low. We were uh, teetering between life and death. You know, extinction uh, was very real as part of the human race. One of the easiest things to do would be to prey upon human beings. And we know that this has happened because archaeologists have uncovered a lot of sites around the world that have human bones in the same area of bones of animals that were processed exactly the same way with no reverence being shown to the, the human bones at all. Uh, this was for gastronomical reasons. There was no ritual involved. It was just that they needed to eat, so they, they, they ate human beings. So let's think about this for a second. Let's go back the whole way until after the last Ice Age gens. You know, it's about 14,000 years ago, and you're trying to make some sort of living for yourself and this group that you have around you, this tribe of maybe 30 people, and you're out in the middle of nowhere, and, you know, at night you start hearing some rustling in the woods, and all of a sudden another tribe comes out of the woods wearing the the garments, wearing the hides of a wolf. You know, that would seem like you were being attacked by a clan of werewolves. And I think these kind of incidences happened uh, in our past to give rise to these werewolf mythos. Um, I do firmly believe it, looking through the archaeological record, looking through any kind of iconography from the past, we do indeed see this idea of people that did uh, assume the identity of uh, of, of the of the animals uh, with the the, the coats they wore. So by that extension, I do believe that this has happened uh, in the past. So I think one of the ways that we encounter uh, legends and the way uh, legends grow is from from fact that this did indeed happen. Now. That's one way to explain the werewolf. That's that's perfectly understandable. The what is not making a lot of sense to me is the supernatural attributions of certain werewolf legends, and of course, as we go into the dogman legend as well, too. The dogman operates far differently than any other archetype of the ones that I have written about, whether it be vampires or mermaids or Bigfoot or what have you. The dogman operates outside of any of these tried and true rules whenever you talk about the archetypes because they are so, well, first of all, they're so terrifying and they're also so hard to pin down. And people have tried to pin them down. Um, people have called um, uh, 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 wolves, regular wolves, that acted with, uh, with, with some sort of intelligence, werewolves as well, too. So that name has been applied to, 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 to real animals, to, uh, you know, to legends, to myths. So it really, I mean, and I wish I could give you a, a more uh, definite answer, but the idea of the dogman, the way it's developed over time, it doesn't fit the mold of all these typical uh, archetypes uh, that I deal with. And it's still out there on its own, standing in the periphery away from all these other things that I've written about because they are so complicated. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a lot to take in. So what about the, okay. If, if we were looking at the mythos, as you were saying of, of vampires and werewolves, there, there is a crossover there. And, and, and for some reason, people always kind of link the two. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, see, I've done some research. Uh, so the, the Bram Stoker's Dracula comes out shortly after, um, Darwin's origin of species come out. So in a way, when we look at the character of Dracula, um, he is kind of, um, throwing the middle finger up to Darwin and showing that a human being is capable of de-evolution and evolution at the same time. So we really don't have the idea of the vampire uh, sh shape-shifting um, in uh, the literature until we have Bram Stoker coming out. Um, now, we do have in, like, the Strigoi in, uh, in Romania, which is what Vladimir Paler would have known as a legend, which is kind of a, like a reanimated corpse. Uh, but when we talk about if we would go to Arabia, we would have the jinn there that has been known to possess a recently deceased corpse, a corpse and reanimate it. So the, the vampire comes from a fear of the dead 
It comes from the fear of contagion and plague and things that can make you sick. Um, and then as it progresses, it becomes something that can, it, it's, it's no, it appears human, but it's not because it become an animal as well. So it doesn't fit any kind of guidelines. So of course, if it doesn't fit any kind of guidelines, then it is outside the world of the order of God, right? It's outside of the natural order of things. So then it becomes something completely different. In this case, some sort of demonic version of humanity. Um, but these are, again, like I said, when we talk about archetypes, these are things that are very hard to pin down because, of course, we do have Judeo-Christian elements and all these things. By the time you hit the Middle Ages, everything is going to have a sense of the Judeo-Christian uh, uh, you know, influence. The light of, of, of God will be shined on them, and then that we're, they, they're going to develop within that light. But if we would go back into the, the Greco-Roman origin of a lot of things, you have um, the word demon you know, coming from the daemon, which was, a, a again, an intelligence in the natural world that would be very similar to the fairies, very similar to elementals, very similar to the jinn. But the farther back in time you go, uh, the more you start seeing these creatures as being very ambiguous. Like the word, um, you know, lichen, where you get, is from King Lycon, uh, who, who uh, was the king of uh, Arcadia. And the reason he was uh, turned into a werewolf is because he made Zeus uh, uh, eat his one child, Lycan's own child, which really is kind of a morality tale that we really can't understand nowadays because I don't think anybody's going to serve their child uh, to somebody you think is the, a god. But he wanted to test Zeus's omniscience, so Zeus immediately turns him into a werewolf. But I think there's a story behind this that we're not getting to because in Arcadia, there is ancient legends there of werewolves. And I think that uh, we, we see this, this myth developing simply because it is a way to explain, um, you know, the certain king that kind of went, you know, hog wild, and uh, we now have a name for these lichens. But originally, you know, going maybe a thousand years before uh, King Lycan, uh, we have these rumors that there is a cult of the werewolf happening there, that that people actually have ceremonies where people are transformed into into werewolves. Uh, and there was one um, uh, writer, um, Pisanius, who was a great travel writer, um, and he said, and he even named the person's name, there was a person that played in the Olympic Games who went to Arcadia, participated in the ceremony, and he did indeed turn into a werewolf for seven years and one day. Now, part of the understanding of this is if you turn into a werewolf, you have a little bit of faculty and a little bit of reason to you, and you'll be able to turn back in seven years if you do not partake of human flesh. Now, again, connecting the dots, if you are caught up in a fairy ring and transported to their world, you usually stay there for a period of about seven years. So we start seeing this recurring thing and these different types of elemental ideas around the world where things start making some sort of sense. Uh, again, we go back to the realm of the elementals. This is something in nature. Uh, of course, uh, the, um, the mountain. Uh, where this takes place, the, this, this, the ritual of the werewolf takes place. It is in a very hidden grove in the woods. So you also have that idea of this being a naturally occurring thing. And we talk about the idea of portals as well, too. You know, it's very possible this is what they were alluding to. Uh, because in order to become a werewolf, you had to bathe in this particular water as well. So there's something strange going on there. And there's also dots to be connected. Yeah, when you're what you're talking about <clears throat> the seven year thing and the Song of Sol or is it the Key of Solomon or the Song of Solomon? I always get those confused, but I think it was in the Key of Solomon where the story is that he had the ring. Um and then that with that ring he could control all of the, 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 the demons, you know, of the world. Um and because because and it all started because of a vampire named Orneus. Um and it's really weird. It's it's a weird tell. Now there's several different versions of it, but there but the 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 main version, the, the the gist of it, and I've told it on my show, and I can't remember exactly. I think it was alternate realities uh, on the show that I did. 
and eventually the 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 chief demon who was who was locked up you know or whatever had been enslaved which is weird because it, he he it, it, he and the muslim culture iblis is the main bad you know the main guy or whatever but this guy he was sort of the main one that had been captured which is weird i don't know whether or not he was the the main shaitan of the jinn or whatever cuz shaitan is actually a race of evil jinn evil beings um, according to Muslim faith. And then actually they are a type of Dibbuk in the Jewish culture too. It's a, it's a shaitan. Um, but it, it's not like here in, in the West, we just call it Satan. And we think that that's just him. He's just one guy. When in reality, there's a race of Satans. Um, but that's what this is. So the main bad guy, his name started with an A. I'm not going to get into his name, but he tricked Solomon into getting drunk, and then Solomon, uh, he took the ring and threw it into the ocean and said, oh, good luck. So Solomon, I, I, in, in the one telling of it, he tries to swim out into the ocean, and he gets carried away in the current, and he, and he sort of drowns, and then he come, but he comes to, and he's in a foreign land. And in this foreign land, he has to dwell there for seven years. See that theme? You're talking about seven years. Sure. Yeah, sure. and so he ends up becoming like uh, uh, he was a prisoner for a while, but then he had skill and he was able to talk and had charisma, and and of course God is is helps him and and so kind of watches over him, but it's kind of like a lesson he had to learn. So so for seven years he dwelled there, and finally he caught the eye of the king's daughter and gained favor, and then eventually uh, he, the king finds out that he's trying to court his daughter or whatever. So he he goes after him and he runs and he gets he escapes goes back into the ocean gets in the ship somehow and he ends up back in Israel um but 7 years had passed in his life but when he ends up back on the shores of Israel he is not um it's like nothing has happened his his men come running to the to the shore and they're like oh you know you you went into the water and you just you, you nearly drowned and you know good thing you're alive and he starts telling them this fantastical tale of how he lived in another kingdom for seven years. But it was kind of like, in the story, it's kind of like God's putting him on notice. You know, like you shouldn't be getting drunk and, and palling around with this demon. Look what just happened. You know, right, and right, then the right. ring gets, he gets the, the seal back, which is the seal of Solomon. It's the ring and it protects him and, and from, from the evil, from the demons, whatever. And it allows him to command all angels and demons. That's what that ring is for. But it's weird. It's interesting because it started with a blood drinking spirit named Ornius that was attacking his chief servant's son, um, and so it was. He was drinking the blood of of this of this child, and the child was very ill, and he was going to die. And and it's it is said that Solomon was fond of the man and his son, so he 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 wanted to help him. So uh, an angel of the Lord comes and gives him a ring and says, "Use this." And so then he captures Ornius. And with that, he forces Ornius to go back and tell the other demons that, that they all have to come and answer to him. And then, of course, they build the temple. And it is said that the first temple was actually built by demons. That's the yeah. story. Yeah. Um, I know. That's what, yeah. Yes. It was using evil to do the good things, which is a paradox in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that, the uh, again, we talk about these creatures, these archetypes uh, from the werewolf on down to the uh, vampire. The idea of preying upon children is a common element in that story as well. And then, of course, it all links together by this seven-year period where, you know, somebody goes into another world and uh, whenever they come back, they are unchanged, but the world around them has changed. Well, what do you think about that with the fairies? Because, or the fae, you know, it's said that if you eat or drink, or I've even heard it, you know, that if, if you hear their music. That's right. Yeah. And I, and I told the story on my show. There was a guy who reached out to me. I don't know. He claimed that, that he went to sleep. He, he sat down on a log in, in the woods. He was hiking. Um, him and his wife were going through uh, some problems. And these two diminutive-looking creatures, the way that they, he described them were like duende, as they say in Spanish. But they were like kind of uh, swarthy-skinned, like darker skin. And they were very friendly with him. And they gave him like a piece of bread or something. And he ate it. Oh, he went to sleep and he woke up like two years later. I mean, this is this, this is what the guy told me. Like he told us this story, you know, it was more than one person he told it to. But I mean, we were just kind of like, really? Um, 
Yeah, well, it turns out this guy had actually gone missing for like two years. Yep. Um, but they said that he was not really like like he had just so so the big knock on the story was oh the guy just made up a story because he wanted to get away from his wife so he went into the woods for two years, um, and then he returned wearing the same clothes that looked like they had not so unless he went into the woods took off his clothes and put them somewhere and then lived feral for two years and then went back and put his clothes back on and went back. Then, you know, of course his wife had, had left. Everything was, you know, it's a whole story, but I mean, it was just weird. Like he, he claims that it all started because of that. Right. Well, I, whenever I was writing my, uh, uh, book on aquatic monsters, of the great lakes, I was up at, uh, Sault Ste. Marie in uh, Michigan because that's where Lake Superior and Lake Michigan come together and uh, I was getting a lot of indigenous reports about, you know, lake monsters in that area. I was actually with an Ojibwa uh, reservation up there. And I was talking to one gentleman, and um, and I was talking about lake monsters. But he brought up the story whenever he was a kid. They were on the shores of uh, Lake, uh, lake Superior. And uh, two little children went missing. Um, and they called out the, uh, the tribal authorities. Uh, they, they searched. Nothing was found. And here as it goes seven years later uh, that these two children were found walking along uh, the shore and they had not changed. You know, it was, they, they were still the same age as whenever they went in and whenever questioned by authorities, they said that they went to the kingdom underneath the water, uh, which is very interesting. And uh, the gentleman explained to me the reason why we didn't hear of this is because um, it's very, um, you know, insular whenever we talk about the Native American uh, system up there. And they just simply didn't put a story like that out. And he was very lucid. He was very, you know, very sober. Uh, and I do believe that this story that he said had some sort of basis in fact. But again, cross cultures, cross time, cross space. This idea of the seven-year element and this thing that where where you go someplace to another realm, you know, it's implicit in all these stories. So there's something about that that makes sense to us on our psyche for some reason. And what are your thoughts on that, Barton? I think it's very strange, you know. Uh, kids going missing and not aging, you know, for seven years. I don't even know how that would be possible unless they were taken into another dimension or what have you it's just so bizarre but you know as far as the seven years go there's a lot of uh, significance to the number seven and, and to a lot of people but i don't know it's going getting into uh numerology and all that so i really don't know josh i really don't know what to make of that well seven if, if you look at numerology the the fact that it has ology at the end of it makes everybody kind of go, Ooh, you know, like it's some sort of uh, bad juju or whatever, but it really, and truly it's just a study of numbers and numbers pretty much tell, tell the tale of the entire universe. There is even a code that's found in all things in nature. Um, I mean, that's the, for a discussion for another show, but like you can get into, like you can go down the rabbit hole of numbers, you know, but seven is considered to be, uh, in, in numerology, it's considered to be a, a, a spiritual number. It's considered to be a higher spiritual number. Um, I know that there are some people that believe 11 is a master number, but if you, if you break down numerology to its base, 11 really doesn't exist. It's actually two. But uh, now if the numbers add up to one, one, that, then some people that study it will say that that's the master number. Others say that nine is the master number because it always has to break down to one number and each number has a significance like uh, as according to people's life paths. And I've noticed, um, I've, I've studied uh, this, you know, you know, for a long time I've studied the numbers and I've looked and I've saw, I've saw patterns. I mean, I really do. I've seen patterns like fives have a certain traits about them. They have certain ways that they do things. Eights, to, uh, that's the infinity number that also, that, that tends to be, uh, somebody who, does well with finances. They make money. Like, like I know people who are eights and they're never broke. I mean, they are never broke. I'm not joking, man. I've looked at this, man. One of them used, was one of our former business partners. Who's I'm just going to be real honest. He's a little crook and he's on his, uh, third or fourth, you know, grift or whatever, but he, he, he stole from us. And, and, uh, you know, my business partner was kind of joking. He goes, well, who get his one day? I said, yeah, but it won't, he won't be broke. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, I, I did his numbers. He's an eight. 
I was like, he always has money. <laughs> you know, um, that doesn't mean he's not building up a lot of bad karma and he's going to go to hell. That's I'm just saying that he's not broke. You know, that's all I'm saying. He can go, he could be in jail and have like, you know, a whole bunch of hostess snack cakes or whatever they use for currency, but he's, he's going to have it because he's an eight. But that doesn't mean that his life's going to be pleasant. Having money or wealth doesn't make you happy. Everybody knows that. So some people equate wealth with, oh, you're doing good. You're you're doing your happy. But what good is your health if your your heart fails or your you know your you have a you know uh, you know cerebral palsy or something? It does you know it doesn't do you any good to just have a bunch of money. But anyway, the eight life paths. So I've noticed they they're they're not broke. I noticed that that's just that's something I've observed. Sevens. They tend to have a very strong grasp of the spirit. You can look this up. I'm a seven because I was born seven fourteen seventy five seven a.m. So I mean, you got seven seven seven. You just gives you know, and the more sevens you have, the more spiritually enlightened you supposedly are. I'm not saying that because every time I say something, they're like, "Oh, look at him! He's talking about himself!" Oh, he's <laughs> rah rah rah, Josh Turner. Well, you know, they just get all fired up. You know, what they don't understand though yeah. is that fires me up even more. So anyway. The seven, though, is considered to be a, a person that, that is spiritually enlightened. They're, they're taught. Now, one thing that I was told, because my mother is Mexican, my dad's uh, Caucasian, my grandmother on my dad's side, she, she was actually my dad's stepmother, but she raised me like I was her own. And, and I was like one of her favorite kids. No offense to the other grandkids out there, but she always told me I was her favorite. And we were very close. And one of the things she told me, she said, I believe, and she called me Joshy. <laughs> Certainly. She said, Joshi, I believe that you were born of, of mixed blood because you are a spiritually uh, powerful. You're like, an, you know, you have an enlightenment that other people don't have. This is my grandmother talking. Everybody's grandmother says good things about them. Okay. I'm not, I'm, you know, they, they always tell you you're handsome and whatever. But she told me that, that it was a reason that I was born, you know, like that. Now, my great aunt on my mom's side, which is kind of like my surrogate grandmother, because my Walita, my grandmother on my mom's side, died when I was two. She said the same thing. She's like, you, you walk in two worlds. And when you're born with Ojo Dotaro, that's what she said, you, you, which is the gift of the eyes. She's like, you, you're walking in two worlds. And I think being uh, of mixed race, especially nowadays, it's not like such a big deal. But when you're born in 1975 in small town te Texas in, in the South, you're a biracial child. Um, I remember people calling me half breed. And, and that happened quite a bit. Like I was, I was called a breed or a half breed a lot. Um, the Mexicans would call me Weto or Galacho or Wadlio, you know, any kind of derogatory thing they could think of. And the whites would call me a half breed or a Mexican, you know, or a Mexican. They, they would say things. It, it was very, it was very racial. And it was a lot of racism growing up that people nowadays, they don't experience. It's not like it used to be. Um, you know, and so you kind of, you're, you're, you kind of feel like an outcast. My sisters were treated differently. And I think it's because they were very pretty, you know. And pretty girls are just treated better. The boy is just, you're just kind of like, man, why is he around? We don't want him here, you know? And so I was mistreated, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I was just, I was treated very bad in particular by the Hispanics. They treated me very, very ugly. And so I had to fight. And, but I, I think that it prepared me for the duality of, of, of nature. And I think that it prepared me to walk in the spirit and in the flesh because you live in two different cultures and you have to adapt and learn both of those cultures. And I use those skills every day now in my job, you know, um, being able to speak Spanish is very important and just being able to talk to people when they're trying to do something that they're not supposed to be doing on a job site. And when they're talking amongst each other and then I say something to them, you know, in Spanish, they're like, oh crap, you know, this person is not just a, they, don't, they, they, they look at you and they realize, you know, you're, you know, so my grandpa, he used to, he used to say, you're a koi dog. You know, he goes, the dogs don't trust you and the coyotes don't like you. He goes, but they have to respect you. He used to always tell me that my grandpa used to, he was, he was, he was kind of racist in his own way, but it was like, he did it because it was like, it was what was expected of him. It was weird because he had a lot of black and Hispanic friends, but you know, he would always try to put up a veneer of, I guess, of racism amongst his white friends. Cause I think that's kind of what was expected, you know? And so he would always be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, this and that. But he would he would always tell me, you know, that, uh, you know, I was his – I know it's a, it's a weird thing to think about, but he would tell me, you know, I was his little hat breed. You know, he's like, you're my hat breed. You know, and he he loved me and he treated me well. You know, I mean, he I was spoiled by him, you know, and my grandmother. But, uh, 
you know, and I was his favorite grandkid too, but I mean, it was just, um, I, they, they would, they would tell me, you know, life's going to be hard for you. And it was, <laughs> it was, it was hard. I grew up, you know, and of course when you, you walk to school and you're going from the neighborhood that I was in, the neighborhood next to mine was the black neighborhood. So I had to walk through that neighborhood to go to school. Well, I was getting my butt kicked in there and then coming back to the barrio, get my butt kicked there too, because I'm a white guy. And I just don't, I don't fit in. So I had to learn to fight to fit in. And once you could fight everybody and then dominate everybody, then, then it was like, oh, okay, then everything's fine because nobody's going to tell you anything. So that's kind of how I grew up. But I think it prepared me for all of this, especially this, this walk through the paranormal, because I understand and I grasp this. And I think that nature, which is presented to you by God, I think he gives you the, 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 the nature so you can perform the tasks that you need to perform, whether it's reaching people, being able to talk to people, being able to communicate with people and bringing people together. And one thing I learned to do was to, to, to research people's cultures and understand other people's languages and their customs and their habits and their religions and to give respect to them. Doesn't mean I have to believe like them, but you respect it because that's their culture, their belief. And that's one thing I respect about you, Ron. You and me have talked about this, and you have a strong understanding of other cultural beliefs. And I think that that makes you a good uh, teacher, uh, a good presenter, well, you know. Well, I appreciate that very much. Yeah, I try to be um, as sensitive as I can to other cultures because we, of course, are not the only culture out there. And uh, so I'd like to give credit where credit is due. So thank you for that. Yeah. And, and talking to you, how many books do you have now, Ron? How many books have you written? Um, I, about 21 books. Uh, they're not all on the paranormal. I've got uh, uh, some other things out there as well, too. But about um, somewhere probably about 13 books on the paranormal, and the rest are on other other topics. And the books on the paranormal, now, you've, oh, wow. I, I know I've bought and se- bought, I've bought and that sounds ridiculous. I bought and several of them, Ron. Uh-oh. Uh no. <laughs> I've, I've purchased a few of them at the conference. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you, Ron was trying to give me these books. He wanted to cut me deal and be nice and all this other stuff. And I told Ron, I said, no, dude, you know, you're not doing this for a hobby. You know, this is, you're trying, you're at this conference, try to, so, you know, I, I, and I strongly encourage you to go out and check out Ron's stuff. Ron, I had a question for you. You did Goblin Universe? I did. Yeah. How long was that for? Uh, that was the first book that I ever wrote, as a matter of fact. Oh, uh, you're talking about Inside the, the Goblin Universe. The, the Inside the Goblin Universe, the show, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that was with Brian Bowden. Well, we were uh, first on um, uh, UK Radio Network, or on uh, a Paramore UK Radio Network for a while. And then um, we went over to uh, one guy's program. And I, I had so much uh, grief from the guy that had that network. I said that I'm not going to do this anymore. Uh, and then I stopped doing it for a while. And then we went to our own little independent thing. But I probably did that for a total of about five years, I think. Yeah, because I remember I used to, to – and you, you guys were still going in 2019, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah we were still still going. Um, it's difficult, though, uh, for the sense uh, – you know, podcasts take a lot of work, guys. You know this as well, too. And, and, and having kids and then having a grandchild, it, it just takes up so much time. And I would love to be able to do it, but to, to do a podcast right, like you guys do, you really have to devote so much time that I simply just do not have. Yeah, it does take up an inordinately large amount of time. And people keep asking me, like, they, you know, they they don't understand, like, how much work goes into this. They really don't. They don't know the behind the scenes, and they have all these critiques and all these things. You could do this, you could do that, how you could do this better, and blah, blah, blah. But unless you're the quarterback and you're they're there on the field and you're trying to not get hit and you're trying to throw passes, you're you don't know what it's like from his perspective. And and so people that uh, <clears throat> don't do these uh, podcasts and don't they don't understand it. Just like being an author, you know. I've seen it, it, it's I'm writing. I'm trying to write. It's very challenging trying to put all this together and tr- even with help, it's trying. It's a it's a very trying thing. And, and I'm starting. You know, you got to have patience and. When you're trying to do that and you're doing a podcast and then you're you're working a job with a large uh, company, um, I'm surprised that I'm even here. <laughs> I can't even sit, you know, it's very hard. But I just remember Goblin Universe. I remember you guys posting 
And I, I just remember that show. I remember hearing some of your episodes. And when you said Goblin Universe earlier, that's a very uh, – that's very accurate. You know, that's that's a good – because when you say inside the Goblin universe, it is basic, basically like the flip side, you know. Um, that's right. It, it's the other side of the coin. I wish I would have uh, coined that term. Uh, that was uh, – I, I believe that was a little bit around John Kill's time. So I think that he actually – if he didn't uh, coin it, he borrowed it from somebody. So I wish I would have had that. But that all goes back to even, um, uh, you know, poets from the uh, – uh, the uh, age of the Enlightenment, you know, you have the uh, uh, the uh, Rossetti's uh, uh, Goblin uh, Market, you know, and all this all this great poetry that was written around the time that there is another world out there, right below our world, that sometimes interacts with you know with, with us from time to time. Mm -hmm. And you, can I ask you this? You personally, like you, have what have you had in interactions with the Goblin universe? Well, yeah, I, I think that whenever we talked about the idea of whatever that was in the woods that was uh, stalking me, um, and then recently, uh, within the, the last couple of years, um, there was a uh, there was no school uh, because we had a snow day, um, and uh, I opened up the door. It was about seven o'clock in the morning, and I noticed there was tracks in my front yard, and um, I, I, you know, this is odd. Uh, but I got a closer look and they looked to be, they were a little under the size of a dollar bill and they were, you can see the toes and these were very small child footprints, uh, that were in my yard. Um, and I, I, I try to trace them. Uh, we were surrounded by woods, but they did not come out of the woods. We kind of just formed there, uh, in the middle of the yard. Uh, but it looked like the thing either stepped out of something or, slowly materialized because you had a right track, a right track, then a left track and a right track. And like, it took a while for it to become physical. It went up to my dining room window and apparently peered in, and then went down over the hill and the tracks disappeared again. Now, whenever you said that, uh, that the person that you were talking about, I believe it was your niece that was almost gifted this sighting. I felt the exact same way with this. That these there's almost an unwritten contract uh, between the goblin realm and yourself, and um, these things know who you are, um, and they. I mean, why else? I'm a, I'm a, a paranormal investigator. The chance of this ha just happening by happenstance is crazy, you know. And these tracks did not appear in any other yards around me. It was just in my yard, so it was kind of like something stepped out of their reality, paid a visit to mine. And then left again. That's what it seemed like to me. It was almost like a, a an epiphany. You know, I'm going to reveal myself to you. I'm not going to do it to the point that you automatically know what's going on. But I'm going to do it in such a way that this is tantalizing evidence to keep you going. I truly felt that I was almost gifted this experience. Do, and, do, and do you, and I can, this is for both of you guys. <clears throat> and I don't even know if I've ever asked you this, Barton, but do you guys believe that you can just be walking along and maybe walk into a portal? Like, I mean, just kind of fall into their world? Well, I don't know. Well, it's never happened to me. It's all I can say. I mean, uh, if they're out there, I've heard, heard stories of people going into portals, but never uh, interviewed anybody personally that's done that. It's always been just stories, and I've never had anything like that happen to me. So I don't know. Uh, the more I research, the more I'm thinking that portals can be natural and they can be intentional as well, too. I think there's two different natures. I think that there are places around this world that have natural energies that allow these portals to open from time to time. You know, in Europe, we would call them ley lines. And, you know, even in Europe to this day, we know that they build churches up above, you know, things that were sacred to pagans that were built upon these energy spots and ley lines. And I think that there's parts of these, these earth energies that can allow for an opening of a portal to one of the other, other side. But I think there's also intentional or, uh, yeah, yeah. Intentional portals as well. too. the idea of putting a fairy door up in your home is almost, but not quite, it's, it's not the same, but I'm, I'm just giving you a, a little bit of uh, a similarity. A lot of people put up fairy doors in their home. But that's almost like a Ouija board as well, too, because what you're mm -hmm. saying 
to the, the to, to the ether is that I'm allowing something to come and go within my home. Same way with a weed. Inviting it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Inviting, that's right. So I think people have to be careful about that kind of stuff uh, because, you know, as you talk about the Sealy and the Unsealy Court, uh, you really don't know what you're going to be getting whenever you open up a door and you invite something to come through. And uh, you you know what the unseely and the seely is, right? You know what that means. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, we can also go to the uh, the uh, fairies of dark and the fairies of light, mm-hmm. and it become much more sinister when we get right down to the basis of everything. Yeah, seely is is basically like a clean. Um, so, like when you say unseely, it basically means to be you know not clean. Mm-hmm. So you have an unclean, um, you know, creature or whatever entity. And, and of course, there's been stories of people who have been taken, um, like when you were talking about the, the sylphs that come at night, um, I fly in the, in the air, you know, and there's stories of people, you know, Irish and British stories of people being grabbed in the middle of the night and, and, and whisked away to the, to the Sealy Court mm-hmm. where they have to mm-hmm. stand judgment for whatever they've done, whether they destroyed a habitation of, of the fairies or they did something, some sort of reproach or insult. And, um, it, it, you know, people will ask you like, well, how could that possibly be? How could this, how could these people possibly, I, I tell, I told somebody the other day and it kind of blew their mind. I said, it happens now. Mm-hmm. And so what do you mean? I said, dude, when you go to sleep, you oftentimes are out of your body. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can go to other realms and if you're not protected, you can end up, you know, Somewhere that you don't want to be. One of the places I've talked about on my show, I think it's episode 39. I always have to give that episode. People ask is, is the city of night. It's a place where if you ever dream about this, it's a city, but it's like, it's a, it's a, it's, there's a countryside to it too, but it's really just like a large uh, industrial city type place. And it's always night there, always dark. And, And when I first talked about it, I had a, you know, a few people send me messages saying, I think I've been to this place. I, I know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. Well, now at this point, you know, there's people who haven't even li- listened to that episode and I'll, I'll tell them, did you hear it from? No, no, no. I, I heard you talk about it on the show. I'll go back and listen to that episode. It was one I did with Laura Ketchledge, the author, and she had a near death experience. So my mother had had a near death experience. And I think that she experienced the other side before she, before she died, uh, you know, in 2000, in the 2021 last uh, last year, and I I tried to tell people I said, look, this is a real place, and you can be stuck in some of these places. It's not like, you know, when someone passes away in their sleep, just suddenly, and there's there's no reason for it. You know, I'm not saying that every time somebody dies, that's what happens, but there are cases of people that just die, um, and you don't know what happens to them. You don't know where they go or why they went or what you know. And um, I believe that these entities have an ability. Um, they appear in people's bedrooms all the time. Why is it so common for them to appear in people's bedrooms? Why not just in the living room or the kitchen? I mean, they do that too. But I mean, why so often are they associated with us sleeping? Um, when we wake up, they're there. You know, you get waking up in the middle of the night, it's right there by your bed. The majority of these intrusions tend to be during sleep time. And, you know, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that, Ron? Well, we're very vulnerable when we're sleeping. But I do believe that that what you said is very true. People talk about, like, astral projection. Uh, but if you look, I mean, we go deep into the historical record here. And we can see what the uh, comments were by the uh, Greeks and the Romans. And they all they completely believe that. There was a, a Greek belief that if you dreamed a dream before dawn, right before dawn, it would become reality. And the idea of, 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 of divination through dreams is something common even to this day. It's, it's a very special place, isn't it? it it's, it's a way that we can escape all the chains within this realm and enter a world completely different, completely foreign, and interact in that world as well, too. But I do believe that we can transcend our physical state here and enter different realms, uh, you know, when we sleep. And that's why so many people are fascinated by uh, dream language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause there's whole books you've written about dreams and oh, interpretation. Absolutely. Yeah. This whole, uh, when you, when it comes to the Bigfoot, 
Now, I know, Barton, where you stand, like you're absolutely, you believe that these things are malevolent. Um, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Because you, and, you, and people will say, well, you know, you're basing it all on your own experience, but that's really, you know, not true because well, I, you've interviewed lots of people like I have who've had very negative obviously. interactions. Um, I think what well, happens in, in, with, the, with the Bigfoot and, and changing course here for the second hair, what happens with this whole, just with all of this, the, whatever someone is researching and whatever conclusion they decide to come to, it seems like that is what they decide they're going to put into whatever research or book or whatever podcast that becomes their narrative and they don't put any of the other side on there. They throw it out. And I think that's a big mistake. Like what you were saying, Ron, like a person that is, is researching dog, man, they're not going to give a crap about if, if they are physical and there's some out there that are hardcore, they're not going to give a crap about the, the orb. They're not going to care about that. They're going to absolutely throw it out. Um, you just pretend like it didn't happen. They'll they'll start the story from when this thing was standing in the yard, just so they can exclude that part of it. Now, you, Ron, when it, when it comes to now, we're talking about Dog Man, but talking about Bigfoot. Do you believe that this thing is out there running around and just an undiscovered species, and we're going to find it one day, or do you think that this thing? leans more toward the metaphysical. What is your opinion on that? Uh, not only do I believe that it uh, leans towards the metaphysical, I also believe that um, in order for manifest itself, there has to be this exchange of energy between uh, the, 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 uh, the, the figure and uh, the witness, the person that's experiencing it as well too. So I think it's a symbiotic relationship. I think that you have to be in the right place in the right time and even the right mindset. And I think that whatever this creature is, it feeds off of the things within you that, that scares you. And that's what takes shape. And I'm not even sure if it takes a physical shape. I know that there's something out there that people are seeing, but I'm not sure if it's not something that's projected onto the, 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 the landscape from the person themselves. So it, it's a very slippery slope whenever it comes to it. I believe firmly when people say they have witnessed these things. But again, we talk about the idea of dreams and going into different realms. Uh, there's nothing to say that what, what these people are seeing is indeed a projection from themselves onto the land or something is projecting an image into their mind. What do you think about that, Barton? I don't know. Uh, I know that uh, it was going to project something to scare me. So I, I've already been through all this. And the scariest experience that I had, Ron, uh, well, actually the second scariest was something that I couldn't see at all. So mm -hmm. these, these things were completely invisible to the naked eye. And, uh, you know, they came up and surrounded my little brother and I one, one night we were stuck uh stuck on this we was fishing on this haunted lake everybody called it haunted lake it was situated in between two cemeteries right so there you had the water and the in the, in the cemetery right, symbolism right, right. and it, it, it was completely invisible so they did a good job scaring us but they didn't do a good job uh projecting anything i don't think but i've often wondered if what what we heard because it, all we heard was uh, the sound of heavy footsteps and limbs breaking, like four or five elephants was running around us in the, in the woods. So when, and when, we, when we finally got up and ran out of uh, fire and back down to the lake, the sounds followed us down there, even though there were no trees down there, right? So I've often wondered if that was some kind of a artificial, uh, you know, thing that was put, that projected into our, our minds because I have a feeling if we would have went back the next day, which I never went back, uh, we, we wouldn't have found a bunch of broken limbs and trees. So. So you're thinking that, that, that <clears throat> you're thinking that like this, the, the breaking of the trees and the limb that didn't really happen. I mean, not in the physical. Right. Sight, it could have been artificially yeah, induced, uh, Auditory hallucination, yeah, that's that's always been a possibility to me. And you'd think that as many people that describe that when, in regards to their Bigfoot encounters or sightings, you know, I always hear the, the snapping of the limbs and the breaking of the trees when these things come uh, in their area. You'd think they'd be pretty easy to track. 
if they were leaving broken trees and snap limbs everywhere they went. But in my areas, I've never come across uh, anything like that. Uh, once or twice, I've come across markers uh, that I considered markers. There was uh, saplings broken off about nine foot above the ground every 10 or 15 yards. But that's about it. So I've never come across any trail of, you know, damaged trees and broken down pushed over trees and broken limbs, you know, and I think if that was really happening, then we could actually track this thing. But that's I don't good, believe that's, that's happening. Good point. good point, Barton, because it'd almost be like King Kong going through the woods, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. And you could easily, so everybody, you know, I've heard so many people who call themselves Bigfoot trackers and I have to laugh <laughs> because if there <laughs> ever was such a thing it, it, to exist, you know, in our culture, we we'd know where these things live, right? We know right where to go and observe them in their own habitat and all that stuff. But we can't do any of that. So, you know, another thing too, I'm I'm, hard, I'm convinced they're not completely physical. I mean, I, I believe they can be physical when they want, or they can just be half physical. I've, I've had uh, reports of just seeing half of a bigfoot coming at them. Oh yeah, upper half and lower half, and the other half will be invisible. And we just, we talked to a guy last night, Josh, that uh, this big creature ran over with some fresh gravel and never made a sound. Sound. And disappeared into the woods through a, uh, the briars and never just kind of faded in and never disturbed a leaf. So mm -hmm. that's, so I think, I think Ron Dry and the true nature of these inhumanoids is finally coming to light. And I, I just have to say, I'm glad I'm still around because I've been, I've been saying this for 20 years online and, um, 45 years in real life. So I'm glad it's, it's finally, you know, the tide is finally turning and we get away from this, uh, this, this bull crap narrative that we've been fed this whole time, you know, for the last 50 years or so. And every time you turn on the TV, you got a uh, Bigfoot show and they're saying, Oh, it's, it's just a monkey. It's, it's, this is the descendant of Gigantopithecus blackie. That's the most popular theory, it's, but it's the least logical theory to me that we could have thousands of these creatures a living breeding population like that running around every country in the world and not be classified or discovered despite our technology which triples daily i mean every day that goes by that these things aren't discovered to me is uh it, uh, it, it makes really no sense we have we have satellites belief. and everything else and we can't find right, them we, yeah. i mean drones I, I got a guy that works for me, happen? dude. He's got a $5,000 drone. Now, $5,000 drone. And he can put that drone, he, like, he, he can he can make it go right up to the freaking highway. And if, if he wanted to, he could look inside your car with that drone. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's unreal, like, right. what what, he, what they can do with these things. I mean, he can make it go, like, a couple miles. Like, it's it's unreal. He was showing us the other day. We were at the mall, and he was he was he was flying it around at the end of the night, and he went all the way across the other side of the parking lot, drew, flew it up to the main road, and came back. I mean, it was unreal, and you could see everything. Um, yeah. How come we can't? Because they're not there to find. Yeah. If they are, they're underground somewhere. Underground, That's yeah, the and they're tearing up trees and throwing trees and all this stuff, and it's like, like I've had right. people tell me that this thing was picking up trees and throwing them, and I'm like, and nobody can find a trail of these things like people are out there in the bush constantly yeah. and they don't see them they don't like how is this possible how is it possible no yeah, it doesn't make any sense so so ron in conclusion um you know your your views seem to be very uh, similar to a lot of people we've interviewed and it's funny because when we set up this series of interviews me and barton we didn't cherry pick like i didn't go hey we're gonna we just we made a list of people that we wanted to do interviews with and, you know, during the pre-interviews or with you, we didn't even pre-interview you. Um, you know, they, they've told us their view and we're like, wow. Um, and it's just kind of fallen yeah, that way. Chances. Yeah. It's not, it's yeah, weird because are, yeah. like all, every one of us are, are, we're thinking the same way here. That's, that's kind of uh, odd in itself. Yeah. And I think that the narrative is people's stories. do what? Yeah. I didn't have a clue. I didn't know any of these people's stories before we talked to them. Yeah. Me neither. No, I didn't have a clue. Yeah, I mean, we're you know, all we're, talking about the same stuff, lights, unexplained lights and and uh, creatures coming out of the woods and, you know, in the same space and time. So 
we're all showing a, a connectivity to all these uh, unexplained phenomena, which people, you know, but it's not hard to believe, but it really is. They're all, they all, they're all connected. It is. It really is. And, uh, I, I appreciate you coming on and talking to us, Ron, uh, before you go, where can people purchase your books and, and name the, uh, just throw the names out there of your paranormal books. If you got them. No, I'm sure. Yeah. So I have an, uh, an on series, uh, that started off with on mermaids, then on wild man, which is tracking Bigfoot through history on dog man, which is tracking werewolf through history, um, on ghosts, um, on aquatic lake monsters, uh, uh, the great lakes. Um, let's see here. Uh, on fairies, um, on, uh, vampires, and on witches is my last one. So I think that's the entire series there. And then I've written um, The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge, A Hike Through Western Pennsylvania's Goblin Universe. Uh, so that was my first one that I wrote. Uh, and um, you can find everything, like everything else, is on Amazon. However, some of my books, like the Vampire book, is now being carried by Walmart, which I'm very, very proud to announce. Uh, so yeah, you wow. can find it at Walmart. Yeah, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty excited about that. So yeah, you can go through Amazon or you can even order it at Walmart if you wanted to. Okay, that's good. So folks, check out Ron's work. You won't be disappointed. Ron is 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 really good. Ron, like I said, why you aren't a household name, I have no idea. You need to be uh, just get you an agent, <laughs> so they can get you on some <laughs> of these shows. So that you can get your word out there, you know, and get get your name more exposed because you had, like I said, the Goblin Universe, which I remember you guys used to used to uh, pr- I used to promote it on my uh, page on Paranormal Roundtable, and uh, and I've known Brian for for years and years, and um and so I just you guys have been doing this for a long time. You've been writing for a long time, and when we do the next Dogman Conference, we're definitely going to have you back. Um, I know. cannot wait, guys. I I really cannot, and I really am flattered by you uh, saying about the uh, you know that I appreciate that. But I think that when we look at television nowadays, uh, the people that are on there are really not the best in the business. They're good talking heads. Uh, they're good at the entertainment side of the paranormal. But uh, that's the reason why I'm such a fan of this podcast is because we can hear intelligent people talking about intelligent things and nobody's saying me, 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 me. I have all the answers, right? And that's what's so good about this podcast. And there's other good podcasts out there as well, too. Uh, but no, I, I, I'm very flattered to be on your show, guys. The only problem that I have is I a terrible, terrible sort of throat here for the past couple of days. And I appreciate you bearing with me as my voice cracked and went in and out and everything like that. But uh, yeah, next time I'll be on here, I'll be all bushy, uh, What's he told in bright eyes? So, well, I, I expect that of you, Ron, a professional. I appreciate, I appreciate <laughs> that, guys. I didn't know. I didn't know you had a sore throat, man. I'm sorry, man. I would have. Oh, no, 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 no. That's okay. Like I was telling you, uh, on, you know, earlier, my my daughter I uh, contracted uh, COVID on uh, on Tuesday, and then I got what I can only assume is uh, is some sort of flu that's going around right now. And yeah, just, just you know, it, it goes with the territory. Whenever you have kids, you're going to get sick. So that's what happens. Yeah. All right. We'll get well soon. Get well soon, Ron. I appreciate that, guys. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, Ron, we appreciate you coming on. And from everybody listening at home, uh, it's Ron Murphy. Check him out. He's got a lot of great stuff. And me and Barton. And uh, for the PRT family, good night. Good night, guys. Good night.